And when I do a landscape, I pull a trick. We bring a tape into the studio and project it on the monitor, which means that that's the best you can do for getting outside here in a studio. Uh, it's an innovation of ours here at um, Cablevision, and I think that it's probably the most effective way that I can possibly talk about painting from what you see. Uh, many, many programs are on the air today that are simply painting either from memory or from some kind of formula, and it is unobserved. So here is a scene which was shot this afternoon uh, at about uh, 2 o'clock, and it's a view of Strong's Neck from the Pokwat side of Setauket Harbor. Uh, anybody who's familiar with the area knows the scene as really uh, absolutely beautiful at any time of the year. Uh, right now, of course, uh, in the fall of the year, the colors are spectacular. They may have been a little bit more spectacular a few days ago. I think it's on the waning side, but nevertheless, the fall colors this year were absolutely remarkable, almost indescribable, and so this is the time to go out and paint. And when I, uh, when I demonstrate these, these um, lessons of painting from life when I go outside and I find the scene and shoot it and we bring it back in, I start of course with a blank canvas. The canvas that I'm using today has been treated with a darker color because it doesn't react well painting on white. All sorts of things happen to the electronics of it. So I treat the canvas. It's a good idea. If you are painting, to work on a white canvas is sometimes a little bit more tricky than to paint on a on a prepared canvas of a darker color. Any color will do, as long as it's not white. So, I have here a 20 by 24 size, and I have it, it's absolutely blank, and I'm going to begin. The first thing that you do uh, when you begin to plan and compose a painting on our planet is to find the horizon line. The horizon line I'm going to use here as the water. It is slightly below uh, the middle of the canvas, and it is to be pulled across uh, as a, on a horizontal line, which of course stands for horizon. As you can see, it is the water line. Above it is merely the incidental of the land mass. It's got, uh, it's got uh, trees and so on, but uh, the horizon line, for the most part, you usually choose a straight line. The one that I'm showing you here is the designation of the foliage. And, the, of course, the houses will be added later. Over on the left side of the canvas, is the land mass, which is uh, the other side of the harbor, and that has a rather large and wonderfully bulbous looking dark shape. But when we get onto the uh, close ups a little bit later on the program, you'll see that the dark shapes uh, take, uh, take more form because uh, the camera tends to distort a little bit of uh, the shadows, and the shadows become very dark and almost indistinct of what's going on inside. However, here is the general layout of this particular piece. The shadows uh, of these trees are going to be playing here in the, in the middle ground, and the darkness of this area is going to be reflected in the water down here. It changes when you're out there in the open and in the open air. It changes. The wind changes, and the surface of the water becomes different. Therefore, this shadow can never be a formula, such as you see on other programs. Sometimes you go and see water painting on programs. They simply pull down the whole color of the dark land, and they think that that looks like a Reflection, it doesn't. It is absolutely, uh, it changes. Therefore, you catch it at the moment that it is the most interesting to you. Here, in the, in the middle ground, is an indication of a small red boat, which I'm going to, uh, which I'm really going to point out the layout to where, to where to place it. I'm going to paint over it later, of course. But that's the, the average placement of it. 
with a little mast dissect, uh, bisecting the, the um, land mass and going into the sky. And then over here, very nicely, there are some ducks that have been, that have been playing in and out of the uh, viewing area, and they're just going to be placed here in the water. show you how I lay these things out. And over on the right side is some marsh grass, which has been inundated with the high tide, but it is still uh, sticking up over the water. All of this is merely a layout. Uh, there is a peeking around the corner here. There is a piece of the land coming out, which gives you an enclosure. And then, of course, as you can see on the monitor, are all of the, uh, the uh, branches that are overhanging from a tree under which we had set the camera, and it's catching the overhead branches. No, I'm not going to put those in now. I must get the sky in because we are on a limited time, and uh, it, would, it is best to work quickly when you're working out of doors because you are fighting things called sunlight and change of sky and change of light source. So uh, the thing to remember when you're working out of doors is speed. When you work with speed, you tend to be a little bit rough. That's why you can go back to the house, studio, whatever you work in, and refine what you worked on out of doors. I'm going to use the palette knife to mix and spread a large amount of almost colorless blue because uh, today the sky was in that wonderful afternoon fall state of being well, almost colorless. It, it wasn't, of course, but it almost was. So with a, just a touch of, of white, of course, the, uh, and I always use flake white because it does not yellow as much as titanium white, something that you may want to remember, and a touch of cerulean blue, which will give me this, um, this very pale tone, which I'm going to put uh, down by the horizon. I will, I will uh, use a brush to smooth this out later, but this is the way in which to apply paint to the canvas very rapidly. Uh, and I'm not doing it just because the show takes uh, such a short time, but because uh, when you work out of doors, you are concerned with the uh, passage of time and light. So putting putting the, uh, putting the uh, sky colors on with a palette knife and any large area that you need to cover in a hurry is absolutely acceptable. Um, I'm going to uh, add, uh, mix another batch of blue getting slightly darker as, we, as it gets towards the uh, top of the canvas and I'm going to temper it or I'm going to subdue it with a touch of orange because atmosphere is with us and the opposite of blue uh, is orange and um, these are things that you know as you practice and learn about the mixing of color that if you want to temper a tone and make it less brilliant, you use its opposite. Uh, here I'm going to apply this. Um, and then as you can see, uh, I'm working towards the top, towards the uh, upper part of the canvas by adding, uh, by adding this darker tone. And when you mix it, when you work with the palette knife, do not uh, rely upon the palette knife um, accidents. They are an absolute no-no. They look uh, amateurish and uh, they, are, they simply don't work. Uh, in, for, for my technique, other people might find that it's quite fascinating, but for me, I do not like the, um, I don't like the accidentals that happen when you use the palette knife. So I'm going to uh, smooth this out, make both of these colors blend by blending them together very, um, uh, very subtly to try and get the blend because when skies in the fall and go from very pale on the horizon to darker towards the top. Uh, that is uh, what is uh, very uh, indicative of the area. Skies tell a great deal of the story. The skies over Long Island are vastly different than the skies over the Middle West or over the Far West or even over Europe. And so be sure that you understand the general anatomy of the skies, especially if you want to be a realist painter. If you don't care about being a realist painter and you're willing to accept just a formula, then you needn't pay attention to any of those particular rules. You just go ahead and paint sky. But if you are interested in recording, I have run out of white, which one always does because the basis of most painting is white. Um, the, um, if you're interested in recording a scene exactly as it is, or as, uh, you know, in interpretation of, of what it is, and you want it recognizable, the skies have to be accurate and so do the cloud formations and so do the colors. 
So as I'm, as I'm uh, uh, working my way higher up on the canvas, I'm adding some tones to darken it because the next time you go out, take a notice of what happens in the sky as you become higher and higher overhead, the sky becomes darker. It's uh, darker in tone because of the atmosphere. All of these things are uh, maybe sound as though it's, a, it's, you know, making too much of a point of atmospheric conditions, but there is an explanation for just about everything that happens out there. And uh, I think that it's always interesting to know why things are taking place. So all of this um, application of color to the sky, as you can see, there are places here where it's darker, but I'm going to smooth those out because the sky at this particular day and this particular season today was absolutely cloudless. There was not a, there was not a sign of uh, even the wispiest kind of cloud. It didn't last long, uh, long about uh, four o'clock, two hours after this was taped, it began to become slightly hazy. And then as I was uh, driving back to the uh, studio here, I heard a report that there is, um, there is a wind disturbance uh, called a small uh, hurricane off North Carolina, which means that there may be clouds um, uh, coming in uh, on their way. But in the meantime, the skies were absolutely cloudless and beautifully clear and very, very smooth. And, and you know, it's what makes for fresh and really airy pictures when you have these wonderful cloudless skies. Uh, however, there's nothing more that I like more than an interesting bunch of, of storm clouds gathering. But when it's clear, it is really something. All right, so we've got the, uh, we've got what is called the, door, the furthest place away, which is the sky, the background. I'm going to be starting to work towards the foreground, and this landmass over here, which is known to all the people of Long Island who know this area, this is Strong's Neck. Um, I'm going to be mixing some uh, yellow ochre, a touch of burnt sienna, and a touch of what is called uh, uh, sap green. It's the only green that I'm really willing to squeeze onto my palette. I do not use greens that come out of tubes. It is an absolute no-no. Uh, they, 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 they make things look absolutely terrible. Uh, uh, you mix greens, uh, and just about anything that you can think of will make green. Yellow and black, yellow and brown, blue and yellow, blue and orange, blue and sienna, yeah, blue and ochre. The whole, the whole gamut of greens is available without ever having to squeeze any out of a tube. So now I'm putting a base coat of that landmass over there, which is a sort of a zero, nothing, uh, amorphous uh, kind of dark paper bag color as a background for the um for the, for the uh, foliage colors that are going to be superimposed over it. As you can see on the monitor, everything is really quite dark over there, especially near the water where the trees are casting their shadows on the ground. Um, I deplore when I see these formula paintings for foliage, whereby you just fill a brush full of color and sort of touch the canvas with it and, and uh, accept that as what looks like a tree. It rarely looks like a tree. A long pointy thing that looks like a triangle does not look like a pine tree. Not in the wildest imagination does it look like a pine tree. However, some of these programs are making you believe that that's the way you do a pine tree. Well, I'm here to debunk that and maybe start an entire program debunking the manner in which some programs are showing you how to landscape paint. All right, I've got this base coat here of a sort of a zero, unfortunate, nothing looking a base color for the land mass, which is going to now start to receive these fall colors. Let me put a little bit of darker tone towards the, um, towards the water here, which is where, where is the shadowy, shadowy area. And as you can see on the, on the reference material, it's extremely dark. Uh, of course, uh, you, uh, I'm sure that anybody who has been watching the show for any amount of time uh, has heard me say repeatedly that there is no way to do a fine arts painting in a period of one hour. But the best that I can do is to do a quick demonstration and then hope that I've gotten it across to you as best I can. I talk endlessly, I know that, and I think I'm going to take a break in a short moment, but just let me, for one instant, did you see that wonderful bird flying over there? See, that's what tells you it's live. There it is. Uh, the live quality of this program can tell you by the activity that takes place. The surface of the water that's moving, the grasses that are blowing in the wind, and those uh, water birds uh, that uh, sometimes cooperate and show up when they should. Uh, here, is, um, here is the manner in which uh, I would begin to do the sunstruck trees in the in the distance there on the land. Only 
only one side of a of an autumn colored tree shows in its brilliant color. Uh, therefore, I will I, I roll the tone on with my brush in in the pale color. Let me do it with some yellow. Maybe that'll be a little bit more um, uh, visible to you. Just one side of the tree is visible, and it, the it, rest of it fades into shadow. I, I believe that you will um, you'll agree that this is a, an, an effective way to do it. My technique of putting this paint on right from the tube is um, is the way in which I like to show that uh, pure colors in, at this time of year are acceptable. Most of the time I say you must mix them. Let me show you how you can blend this the shadow side of this tree and of course the next one is going to bu is going to go right up against uh, is going to go right up against it but the, but the preparation of the dark area has been done so that the shadow part of the tree is um, is uh, the illusion is there. I'm going to take a break now. I, if we step back and don't have such a close look at it, we'll see that maybe this is beginning to look like what it looks like over there. Don't go away. I'll be right back. back again that wasn't too bad and uh, proceeding along with the interpretation of this wonderful time of year here by the uh, here on, on Long Island which is um, actually maybe past its peak time but still absolutely remarkable in the way of colors there are some spots that you can still find anyway as I'm talking I am telling you about the the introduction of the color of the trees over a prepared uh, landmass surface as you can see the Sun is coming from here and it is thrown Throwing light on these uh, on these innumerable trees that are in their full uh, well maybe peak color at this point. There is a variety of them. There is brilliant scarlet. There's orange, deep orange, um, uh, burnt sienna, dark red, and so on. And um, I'm not here doing a catalog um, of the trees abroad over there on the other side of the water. I'm giving an interpretation. It is uh, it is uh, foolish to think that you would take every single tree and attempt to uh, to um, to designate that particular tree. You do it because you're you're here uh, interpreting what you see. And um, as you can see, the painting is beginning to really look as if the sun is coming from that direction from the left and is casting its light on these trees. Every once in a while you'll find an extremely dark area and I'm going to be using uh, a deep um, uh, alizarin crimson over here because the trees are doing very interesting things this year. They are going from red to yellow without any warning. Um, and I don't quite understand it, but I'm willing to uh, just watch it in amazement and attempt to paint it. Um, there is another way of doing this. If you were to put your, if I put my brush in the yellow in one place, and then I am hoping that I can, with an eye, see there is yellow on one end of the brush and there is red on the other. And this can kind of give you a feeling of how you can interpret this um, effectively by putting two colors on the brush at once. It's an, it's an old technique. It's been done by the classic painters for years and years and uh, it's um it's very acceptable, especially when you're trying to get a very special and very mysterious effect. So anyway, I have 
worked my way all the way across here to to the practically to the end of Strong's neck. Let's put a nice big scarlet one in here just because it's so exciting to see these trees do these uh, remarkable things. Um, uh, the uh, there is a there are some areas where some very pale green has not turned at all uh, yet because the uh, the uh, the winter hasn't hit yet. So some of the lawns across the way there are brilliant green, and um, they are catching the light uh, as the uh, as the afternoon sun begins to go down. So just a suggestion of those. Also, as long as we're uh, over over on the other side of the water, there is a suggestion of houses. Uh, um, maybe just the white wall side of a house that is still being caught by the light is enough to be able to tell you that there are humans over there. Uh, we don't, you don't have to do much. You can just merely suggest that here's the, here's the gable of a house and the, ca the sun is catching it. And anything more than that uh, makes it look like folk art. You don't want to, um, uh, nothing wrong with folk art, but this is a, uh, this is a exercise in realism. Uh, the introduction of the houses over there has got to do with all sorts of things, shadows on the houses from the trees, the whole bit. And so uh, just a suggestion is all you need because this is not a painting of houses, this is a painting of a harbor with incidental houses on it. The water uh, over at that point is very much the same color as the sky but slightly subdued, which is what happens when you're there to observe it. And let me, sh let me pull a nice uh, uh, brush full of subdued blue across here because it seems to be quite pale against the land. Um, a brush full of color is better than a brush with no color and that's why I've gone back to it to pick some more up. Uh, don't be afraid to use color. I know that they're expensive, but they but they have to be used in order to get the painterly effect, which is what everybody is after. So with a um, with a uh, brush full of color, I'm going to be. Uh, uh, um, blocking in the water area, I'm now going to dip into a very dangerous color. Anybody who has been using color knows that thalo blue is absolutely lethal and it has to be treated with great respect and never used pure. Um, it ha also has to be tempered or toned down with uh, burnt sienna. Now here are some, here are some uh, surface disturbances on the water, which is what happens whenever there is a watery place. The wind is free to run across the water and when it does that, it causes these dark horizontal streaks. They are um, they're there, they are to be observed, and they're to be put down as they happen. Uh, naturally, this uh, water surface changes very, very rapidly as the day wears on or as the wind kicks up. And so the best that you can hope for is to put it in very rapidly. There is a glow of pale color on this water right now as I'm looking at this monitor. Therefore, I'm going to introduce some very pale color coming on the sub, here's the shadow side of this landmass. The pale color seems to be coming forward towards the foreground. And uh, this is when you, uh, when I er mentioned earlier in the program to work rapidly. Uh, because you are dealing with changes of light. I'm also holding my canvas because it's not being, uh, it's not behaving itself on the easel here, but that's what happens out there when you're painting out there. The wind picks things up or your canvas moves or you don't have the proper setup because painting out of doors does present um, logistic problems, uh, problems of how you set up and how you sit and how you deal with the elements. So um, for the most part, the best that we can do is to kind of duplicate that kind of uh, condition here in the studio. As you can see, the, the, the easel is moving and so is the canvas, but it's all a replica of the events that take place out there. Um, I'm going to put the water disturbances, the surface disturbances on the water in a moment. Uh, and show you that the more the more um, free you are with that kind of thing, the better it is. So pulling a brush across and trying to keep the lines as straight as possible because we are on a horizontal planet. And some of the lines become darker than others. Some of them are with little wavelets. Some of them are broken up, such as you see here. And you may break them up by simply uh, doing exactly that, uh, putting the brush on the, on the canvas and, and um, lifting it. These little wavelets, this is rough. It is going to be refined in the studio, but for the most part, this is the, uh, what has to be, you have to pay attention to these things as you're out there working in the, 
in the field. Um, the water disturbance is much more visible in the foreground uh, than it is in the background because the background is so far away. So when you are doing these, um, well, these interpreting these little wavelets, you understand that they are more visible when they're near to you. Um, over here in the dark landmass, there is uh, the color of the of the landmass in the water, but it also uh, I'm going to put the dark in first so that you'll understand what I'm saying and hope that I can get enough done on this particular session to be able to concentrate on some details on the next one. I'm doing this in two parts. This is part one, and part two will be coming along at another time. So. I'm now going to um, sketch in the land mass over here. I've got, to, uh, I've got to pull down some of this color because the trees have lost their leaves and there's a lot of sky showing through this sky here. So let me pull some of this down to prepare for it. The, uh, the layout goes much higher than this sky and I'm, and I'm sure that this is going to be quite understandable in a moment when I get to it. Um, I'm going to use the same kind of uh, dark, nothing uh, 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 tone for the land, uh, for this uh, semi-silhouetted um, uh, arrangement of trees over here. Um, it, uh, the, uh, the branches, now, in order to do these and make it realistic, you have to understand that sky is being seen through some of these leaves, and therefore, um, that has to be paid attention to. You can't just throw a whole bunch of color on here and hope that it looks like a tree. All of these little uh, silhouetted lacy places here are because the trees are silhouetted against the sky and they are not as full foliage as they were in the summertime. Also, they have a different form. Some of them go a little bit higher. But the, the painting of trees and foliage has got to be done with a very purposeful stroke. It cannot be done by uh, getting a brush full of color and hoping to heck it looks like a tree. It just is not the way you do it. And um, uh, if anybody has been trying to paint the way some of the programs are telling you, you will run into nothing but fr frustration and um, maybe even give up, which is the last thing in the world that you ought to do. You must keep going and keep attempting to do, to record what you see uh, when you're out there in the wild, as it were. Well, I'm afraid time has come to an end. I'm really, uh, really always uh, kind of disappointed that the clock doesn't stop for me, but it doesn't. And so I hope that you got something out of this number one attempt to do this landscape painting in this wonderful fall of the year. Uh, do watch the papers so that you can know when the next time this program is uh, going to be completed. So uh, thanks for watching. I hope you got something out of it. And as I said before, keep your brushes clean. Bye-bye. Pat Window saying see you next time. <laughs>